I see him in the chat, Chef Bashir Mounier. It's a ridiculously talented roster here at, at Quell. And Chef Bashir is going to join us in a minute. Today, we're going to be talking about food and identity. Chef. This guy. Happy Friday to you, too. For anyone. Thank you. What week is it, Ryan? <laughs> it's Wednesday. You've got jokes, eh? <laughs> so quickly, for anybody that's wondering why my guy is just burying me right now, is because I spent the entire day up until we spoke earlier today thinking it was Tuesday and our lives are a Wednesday. So he's like, are you ready for today? And I'm like, huh? So yes, <laughs> you, you deserve to definitely clown me in. Yeah, I wish it was Friday. I definitely do. How are you doing, brother? You know, I'm, I'm so good. Uh, I had a fantastic week. I had a fantastic session yesterday with Trevor and I'm so right. happy to be here with you. Like, I see all your work on Instagram. Um, I'm drooling, I'm salivating. But before anybody goes any further, the first time that I actually, I mean, we have like six degrees of separation, but the first time that I actually saw you, uh, there was some kind of like a collective gathering of people in the food industry during COVID and suggestion and so forth. And we were in this Zoom call, and I've never seen you before. And then you showed up with your baby in your arm, smiling. <laughs> Like, yeah. Damn, this guy got a game. <laughs> yeah, like, baby, like, like a beautiful smile. It's like, I want to be friends with this guy. So I'm happy to be here. Um, Man. So, yeah, so let me fix my camera as well. I just want to make sure that now you can see the, the food as well. Excellent. Excellent. That That's why I'm so excited about today. Not only is speaking with you always fun, always insightful, always just a great time, but you've got something very special prepared for us today in the form of uh, a delicious meal that, again, because of my forgetful nature, <laughs> I'm not having because I was supposed to partake in this meal and I forgot to let you know that I wasn't going to be where I said I'm going to be. Um, but <laughs> let everybody know before, actually, you know what, let's do this correctly. Uh, we're talking because we know each other. We love each other. Everybody, this is Chef Bashir Mounier. Please introduce yourself for the folks who may not know you. Okay, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Bashir Mounier, uh, born in Mogadishu, Somalia, the land of poets. Uh, I traveled and lived in, this, in Italy for about 13 years of my life, so hope this little funny accent. I lived in the States for a couple of years. I lived in Virginia, and coming from Italy, going to Virginia, there was a bit of a cultural shock. And I ran from my life up here. So I've been here now for 26 years. <laughs> so Tron, Tron is home to me right now. Uh, I'm married to a lovely woman from Barbados, and I've heard that you are from Barbados as well. Yes, and we sir. Have a, um, we have a 22-year-old son, a 20-year-old daughter, and a 13-year-old daughter. We just got a little dog right now. She's like yeah. a new addition to our family. Uh, Full-time, I teach at Joe Brown College as a culinary professor. Um, I'm a chef. I love, love food, but the food that I love the most is the food that I always kind of like yearn in my life. You know, growing up in Italy, I loved Italian food, Mediterranean cuisine, but it was always something missing. I'm looking at the food, it's like it smells and it tastes delicious, but I'm not yeah. in that food, you know? So for many right. years, I've been having kind of a journey trying to find myself, and I decided to go with this nomadic comfort food. You know, being yeah. as a Somali person growing up in Italy and living in the States and being here, there is a constant journey, but also Somali people, by nature, we are nomads. You know, right. we have a, we are pastoral culture. We don't have like a big agricultural system. So for thousands of years, so we just took our camels across, you know, the land. <laughs> and through yeah. this journey, we always yeah. found something new. And I feel that there's that thing of me constantly going. So. My right. name is Bashir Mundi. The food that I do is called the Nomadi Comfort Food. Pay homage yeah. to my own community, my own culture. And I'm so, so happy to be here with you. So thank you for inviting me, Ryan. Of course, of course. I'm so glad that you're here. And we couldn't have you here, although I know we could speak about a million things, and I'm sure we will, but we could not have you here without flexing those culinary muscles. What, for everybody who's not aware, are you making today? What are you going to teach us how to make? So tonight I'm going to be making a Creole duck. So we're going to like the southern part of the state. So we're going to explain a little bit why we're doing this particular dish tonight. So mm -hmm. I'm going to offer you guys tonight uh, duck 
with Creole seasonings. So I have like a beautiful black breast right here. I have my own Creole seasonings. Uh, we're gonna be doing some candied yams, which are already here, ready to go. And wow. as soon as you say, you know, I have some buttermilk cornbread as well. So that's what I'm gonna be cooking tonight. But before we dive in cooking, for yes. those who have not met you before, can you share about who you are and tell us some of your personal experience, please? I would love to hear that. Of course. So for anyone who doesn't know me, my name is Ryan Hinkson. I run a food account called Eat Famous. I basically um, have a job that's made very easy by talented people like Bashir because I, I run around, I take photos of food, I tell stories surrounding food, uh, create food content, whether that's for myself on my own feed. I work with restaurants and brands trying to tell their stories. Very, very passionate about telling the stories of uh, people that look like myself, um, people who have been silenced, people who may not have a platform that's a massive passion of mine, kind of trying to shake this food industry, throw it on its ear, refigure, reconfigure things, and you know, let them know that everybody eats, that everyone loves food, and that everybody has something to contribute um, to this this space that we all inhabit and share. So that's that's awesome. a big thing about me. And like you mentioned, my roots are tied to the beautiful island of Barbados. So when I heard that your wife was uh was beige and i was like well that technically we're family then because i know some way down the road your wife and i have to be connected so i've always called you my brother but truthfully you know you are definitely like you're locked in now thank you thank you very kind of you you know i um uh, yeah I, I i've been cooking now in toronto since 1996. okay uh, it wasn't supposed to be my path in life i was supposed to be going to maybe law or do other things okay. and um, i found comfort in cooking so the first training program was in 1996 uh, at the ymca and i totally mm -hmm. fell in love with that i think there was some something that really drove me there there was this this need to satisfy to please uh this constant movement and nine to five yeah. in a cubicle doesn't work for me it doesn't really right. work for me so i'm comforting cooking now i'm teaching at Brown college i hosted yeah. supper clubs that in a catering company but i also had a, a business called my little dumplings and i used okay. to sell yeah i used to sell for five years culturally diverse dumplings all handmade dumplings yeah. from different parts of the world and when right. i'm looking back into the nature of my business the people just like why dumplings i was like what a better way to have a black guy selling dumplings to spark a conversation. <laughs> right. A conversation. You know, right. Actually, I think I think I had more people ask me, but you're in Chinese, than ask, actually ask me what's <laughs> in your dumpling. And that goes back right. to the, the level of racism that we have in Canada. So tonight, yeah. we, although we are celebrating Black History Month, mm -hmm. you know, on, on, on the Quell platform, you're also talking about that after those 28 days, March 1st, we're yeah. still going to be black. And so it's going to be in March. Well, I, I'm still going to be black after February. And that actually, one of my fa my favorite posts from you usually um, are posts where you show your incredible creations. But the post that you mentioned about, you know, hey, I love everybody that I work with. But after February, I'm still going to be black. So you can still hire me. It rings so, so true. Right. That was such an it was hilarious message, but it was a very, very true message. So when you mentioned that you were doing these dumplings, but, you know, you were looked at like with a puzzled kind of face because you didn't fit what people thought uh, someone who's making doubling should look like. I think that walks us right into our discussion tonight about food and identity. And when we listen to this delicious menu that you're preparing tonight, that also strikes a chord on the topic of identity, because I guess if we run it down again, you know, you mentioned some cornbread and things that most people would assume are southern american or like uh soul food dishes right but you wouldn't call this menu a soul food dish so why don't you explain a little bit about that yeah because soul food specifically belongs to the african-american experience although right. i'm a black person being directly from the continent it is not my own heritage dish rice mm. and goat meat and the side of a banana that's what it calls to me Above yeah. and beyond, there are a lot of other beautiful dishes, but there's something that really resonated with me. But the reason that I'm doing this particular dish is to bring the intersectionality between who's local and who's diverse. You know, right. when you see us in the picture, you and I are the ethnic, cheap and cheerful food. You know, when you see mm -hmm. duck in the menu, you associate duck confit, duck breast, something that mostly white people can cook 
Those are, those are the people that get celebrated. They have all the accolades. Meantime, our own community, whether you are in Barbados, whether you're in Somalia, our food is based on what the land provides us. So right. I just wanted to break some of the stigma and taboo and shame behind our own food and showcase that we cook dog food. Now, the reason right. I'm cooking this food down here, the people from the Creole people from the southern part of the states, I kind of make me think about the Somali people as well. We okay. are on the coast. We are the furthest right. northern eastern corner of the, of the continent. And the food in Somalia, it's a combination between Yemeni influence, okay. Indian cuisine, Bantu, mm -hmm. and all the right. colonizers as well. So we have right. Italians, French, and English. So we eat rice, we eat pasta, we eat mm -hmm. rice with bas uh, basmati yeah. rice. There right. is that kind of an intersectionality between all of those communities, and so right. is the Creole. The African, the African slaves that have been brought from the, from, from the West Africa to the Caribbean to the States, or coming yeah. from Mexico, or coming from Brazil and so forth, right? So they brought mm -hmm. a lot of the spices and seasonings. So those spices right. and seasonings that I'm using tonight, we yeah. have in Somalia, we call, it, we call it hawaj. But, you know, the Creole people, they have like a variety of house blend mixes. And from house to house, in a lot of the southern parts of the states, they make them different. So this right. is the intersectionality between the African-American experience, the indigenous community and the food that they had it, and some of right. the influences of the Acadian, the French people who were also in that part of the states as well. So right. this dish right here is kind of like a little bit of Somalia, a little bit right here, but the theme mm -hmm. is pretty much the same. You know, what the land provides you and coming up with food that kind of smells, look, and maybe even tastes like me. So the right. duck also, because it's a local duck. It's in Stouffville mm -hmm. now because a lot of the restaurants are closed. You can buy this whole duck for $12. Wow. I'm able to make wow. multiple meals for my family. So if you right. go to a grocery store, you might buy a chicken for that amount of money. So I'm bringing yeah. the local part of the duck. I'm making cornbread because cornbread, it's a staple also in many other African countries as well. Yes. But also right. the fact that corn, it's the quintessential vegetables that it grows here in the Americas as well. So mm -hmm. the corn has as much of a value and importance to many indigenous communities as well. So right. cornbread, I thought that would be a classic dish to do. And sweet yeah. potatoes, because here in the area we grow sweet potatoes as well. Now, on top of that, I also love greens. And I love collard greens, but I thought the Swiss chard, it also speaks about my experience growing up in Italy. So like, okay. honestly, like, look at all the vibrant in this thing. Like you got I'm yellow, white, green, kind of like this bowl right here kind of looks like Toronto. <laughs> Did you catch me leaning in like you were passing it to me? Like I almost fell for it. Like I was like, oh, thanks, Bashir, I appreciate it. I can't even give you a hard time about me not having the food tonight because you, you were actually trying really, really hard to, uh, to get me some of what's happening. But hopefully we'll work that out. I, I want to touch on something you mentioned earlier about um, the duck and duck confit and again this just kind of goes right back into what we're talking about is you know as a technique it's something that's seen as European and elevated and something that you know somebody of African descent may not do but a lot of times what we get hung up on are uh, like European or North American uh, terminology for processes and techniques, which a lot of other places have or might have even developed, it's just not called that. So you could have something that's called a confit and it's looked as elevated and more elegant, uh, a more sophisticated dish, but it's completely ignoring that that's not a technique that's isolated to say Europe or, or North America. Actually, most cultures around the world, they had a different form of preservation, whether you mm -hmm. preserve the food by using the sun and dehydrating it, whether you're using salt or whether you submerge it in fat. Another right. reason why I'm doing this dish is because in Somalia, one of the quintessential meals of the nomads is called otka, which is usually <laughs> sun-dried jerky meat, whether if it's beef, goat, sheep, or camel, and then right. it's preserved in its own fat, from the fat from that animal, and right. it gets served inside this, I have this vessel right here. Mm -hmm. You know, so you put in this vessel right here, you put some dates as well, the fat congeals, it covers the meat, and in the desert at night time when it's cold, you open this thing and you take right. a little bit of that out, right? So the form of preservation is something that most cultures around the world that have it. Right. So I wanted right. to, want to come in my own personal experience as an omelet and the food that we want to celebrate. Yeah, I mean, the irony is, you know, somebody of African descent or, you know, if say you were raised here 
and you go to a restaurant at, I don't know, age 25 and you have a confit dish and you think, oh, wow, I'm having this for the first time, but you're really not. You know what I mean? Like, it again, that, that terminology and the framing of of whether it's technique process again is you know very eurocentric a lot of times and can isolate others or have a stigma attached to our food that makes it either um, seen as you know an occasional meal or something that should be priced a little lower or something that is you know so foreign and so exotic when there are a lot of not only similarities but influences because when you know you speak of like where you know Somalia is bordered by and who colonized it, but it's not that these things just come to Somalia and dictate what happens. Like your processes and your traditions, they also leave too, right? So when they're taking, when they're going away, they're taking back something, and I think we lose a lot of that. And you know what? That's a fantastic point that you're bringing out because sometimes people they tend to forget how much those uh, BIPOC community food language, music, art has been appropriated from other Eurocentric spaces as well. Now, before right. we dive in, we don't have all night long. I'm getting a little bit of a hungry. How about we start cooking as well? <laughs> For sure. The cornbread, because the cornbread takes about 20 minutes. So okay. here I have my buttermilk, I have a buttermilk, I have my eggs, and I have a little bit of a clarified butter. So everything right here, I have a little bit of a maple syrup for some sweetness. Now, okay, so that's a really bread, simple start. Pardon me? Sorry, a really simple start. So just about four things to start in the bowl. Eggs, milk, uh, a little bit of a, a maple, uh, maple sugar, a uh, maple syrup or honey, and a couple of eggs. Right. Okay. okay. Now, if you have people that they really love you, they should call you and say to you, brother, hook me up, give me the recipe, and we're happy to share the recipe as well. Okay. Oh, we're definitely here, sharing the recipe. Absolutely. In here we have a little bit of a um, cornmeal, one cup of cornmeal, one cup of flour, some brown sugar, some nutmeg. Uh, what else is in here? And a little bit of baking powder. That's okay. how simple it is. You put these ingredients together, give them a little mix. You know, the beautiful thing about this recipe right here, this is mm -hmm. great for breakfast. It's great yeah. for lunch, after yeah. noon snacks. And if you have any leftover, I'm not really sure why would you have any leftover. <laughs> if you have any leftover, if you right. have any leftover, you know, and becomes a little bit hard, oven dry them in a very low heat. So now you're finding yourself with some crackers as well. Right. Right? Got you, so got this you. Is the, this is the cornmeal, the cornbread that keeps on giving. Okay? Yes, so I love it. So our cornbread is looking good. And that's a little bit more. Now, Ryan, do you eat cornbread at home? Do you guys make it? Yes, we do. We do. Um, and again, so, you know, growing up in a Bayesian household, you have owner or you feel ownership of the, the dishes that, you know, you come up eating. So I remember when learning that it was like a staple in other parts of the world and in like, um, you know, an, an American household or, you know, other parts of the Caribbean or Africa. I was a little surprised because I was like, oh, my mom makes this. This has to be a Bayesian thing when, you know, when you're younger. Right. So I, I've. I have great, great experiences with it. And I will have to say that my mom makes the best cornbread ever, period. Now, granted, I'm willing to try anybody who thinks that uh, they can knock moms off of the pedestal. So I, I'll be the judge gracefully. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not so you know, uh, narrow minded that I won't try the competition. That, that includes you too, bro. That includes yours. Listen, you can say, you know, that shit, that was, that was good. It was really nice, but yeah. you never, ever, ever beat your mother comrade because it doesn't really matter what I'm going to put in there. The right. sweat from her forehead, that's what provides the flavor in the dish. You know, the um, magic little thing. That and the fact that my parents are on Instagram, so they would catch me if I had <laughs> dare said that, you know, <laughs> that somebody beat them at something. So... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I have my oven pre ready at 400 degrees. My comrade makes okay. it inside the oven. Right. And Bashir, do you generally do like one large pan or do you do like muffins? Because I remember moms used to do a little bit of both. Sometimes it would be cornbread muffins, you know, or just a big pan and you just cut up and take as much as you can. What do you prefer? So I, I like. It depends. Sometimes I do a lot of cooking classes, like I had a one for lunch and I had a one for dinner. So whatever there is around. I'm not really picky. Like my Got wife you. makes a, a really, really lovely um, uh, 
black cake. She makes like really, really delicious. So I okay. tried to offer the hands. It's like, no, 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 no. We only use this one. I was like, we don't need it that much. It's like, no, 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 we're gonna need it that much. So he has the same pan that you gotta go for it. Do not, do not play with Bajans and their black cake in their pants. Another thing that my parents, well, actually my pops on in the matter, he is like the black cake king. Oh, I'm seeing somebody in the chat said I made croutons with cornbread leftovers. So that's a pretty smart idea. And also proof that cornbread sometimes does get left over. Absolutely. Not in my house, but yeah. Not in my house either. <laughs> right. So you were saying that you, you oven set to 400 degrees. How long um, do you usually keep it in for? About 20 minutes. Then I'm going to okay. take over and what happened, like the residual heat is still cooking, right? right? So this recipe right here, it calls for dairies, but you can substitute the dairy and you can add coconut milk. You can add mm -hmm. kaffir. You know, there's right. also like a gluten-free flour nowadays. You can go to the bulk bar and substitute it like one-to-one. -one. So literally, right. this is like a bulletproof recipe and it works okay. really, really well. Those are the flavors that I, I like to add in there. A little bit of a nutmeg as well. You can add cinnamon, you can add allspice and the list goes on and on and on. From household to household, the very, this is what I, I love it because it, it kind of like flat note. So then it can become like a sweet by adding like a fruit compote on top of it or it can stay savory because after that, I'm going to be cooking that duck. All that fat is going to go all over that bread. So and I'm you not going to lose it. Yeah, we're just stopping that right right up. Is there anything in your style of making cornbread um, that is like a distinct influence, uh, like a Somali influence? Is there anything that would have somebody blindfolded and they taste it, yours or anybody else from Somali, and say, yeah, that is a Somali influence on cornbread? Absolutely not. I, you know, I haven't made it um, with the Somali hawash mix. The Somali, we have like a lot of what we call them like the Indian spices, predominantly mm -hmm. a lot of a cardamom, black pepper, uh, right. cinnamon. And so we have a lot of those, those spices because we consume them a lot, both for savory and sweet dishes. But right, my yeah. cornbread, I just like it. I like it like that because also I'm not just catering to myself. I'm catering to my family and my family like it like that. Actually, my gotcha. wife runs here. My wife runs the house. <laughs> <laughs> I just follow instructions. I just Smart follow man. instructions. <laughs> got you. I got you, Ryan. No, we know what's Another thing that I wanted to ask you, Ryan, like, so now, you know, we, we, we had this humorous thing about 28 days, uh, and now the whole 12 conversation is around food and identity, and acknowledging yeah. and understanding the fact that our own racialized experience past yeah. this particular month, whether it's the Pride Week, whether it's going to be Indigenous Day, whether it's going to be Chinese New Year, our mm -hmm. racialized experience is still going to be there. So now yeah. the question is, okay, what are we saying to those communities that are the gatekeepers for those people right. that actually have some of the power and the decision making with a lot of the companies and corporations? We're not going to name right. names, but you have worked for a lot of companies and corporations, sure. and yeah. you see, you know, on, 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 a, on a board level, the amount yeah. of racialized experience is like very, 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 very small. So yeah. what are we talking about this particular month, of, specifically for us as members of 12? Well, I can even say for myself, uh, prior to, to Black History Month, and just through, um, you know, the whole kind of thing that everyone witnessed uh, uh, this past summer, right? I The influx of offers and deals started to raise as, you know, racial injustice was highlighted and anti-Black racism was highlighted. I was seeing a lot more conversations from large corporations who, you know, at on first sight, you're, the assumption is that they're just kind of, you know, checking off diversity boxes. So for me, what was really important was having much longer conversations with the people that were looking me to, to produce content for them or partner with them uh, than I generally had before. Before, you know, it was, it was a, I, would, I would obviously choose how I would work with carefully, but now it was, it was double fold because I wanted to ensure that I wasn't just you know, experiencing any tokenism or I was just somebody's check mark. So I had to ask hard questions of a lot of prospective new partners about, you know, not only, okay, it's cool that you want to work with me and have me visually in a face where people can say, yeah, okay, yeah, they're working with Ryan or working with a black person, but what are you doing inside where that people can't see? What are you doing in terms of hiring practices and changing, you know, organizational procedures? So I think even prior to the development of more than, um, as we saw this kind of groundswell of people taking up uh, causes for, for BIPOC people, you know, 
accountability and making sure that everybody who um, is coming forth to, to with in terms of allyship is understanding what's what's required and what's really really needed for it to be effective so when we get to now february i think my frame of mind already had kind of been that like although i always knew or or kind of you know acted in a way that the i knew that these conversations needed to be longer it's just intensified it's really just intensified now Yes, but I spoke with Trevor specifically around many of the experiences the Chinese community have been having, specifically yeah. coming from the black community as well. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the experiences of the Chinese community, Koreans, uh, Japanese, and, and all the, 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 the Northern Asian and the South Asian community, that kind of racism, that kind of prejudice has been going on for so long. But yeah. during COVID, it really accentuated a lot. And the conversation yeah. that we had yesterday was the, to look a little bit deep down on ourselves, both black mm -hmm. and Chinese community, well, and acknowledge some of the things that we have done, participated, yeah. and contributed for much of the, the, the prejudice that we have also contributed. And as yeah. I was speaking to people about my own personal growth, uh, not this past year, but for quite some time, every now and then there is an emotional fatigue having to express that element of a vulnerability to talk about the wrong things that you've done. And I feel yeah. that now that we are adults, it is okay to say, I've done all of those things. Uh, and yeah. over the time, I've grown, I've learned. Now that I've learned, you know, what are the actions that I take? So right. myself, in a place of authority, in a place of a power, teaching to students, uh, those are the frame and the lenses that I bring into my classes. Yeah. So to my classes, I tell them always, let's talk about race, class, and gender in the food industry. And if you right. are a person of color, what does that mean to you? And if you are a woman or a person from the LGBTQ plus two, what does it mean to you? And if you are mm -hmm. a poor person being in the food industry, what is different from somebody that is a privileged person that can go yeah. and sit in some of the best restaurants in the world? And mm -hmm. many of those young cooks and many of the young people in the food industry don't really have those critical lenses as well. So now right. that I've grown and I've learned from many of the mistakes and many of the things that I've done between misogyny, between homophobia and so forth, mm -hmm. now it's important for us to be able to say enough. Quell is quell. Yeah. Enough is yeah. enough. So what are the things that we are going to do moving right. forward? And I think this kind of a conversation creates some awareness, but what else do you think that we can do above and beyond the conversation? Well, so what I, I remember through, you know, again, I'll reference this past summer and a lot of friends of mine or colleagues, people I'm associated with who aren't part of the BIPOC community, you know, would come to me and ask me, you know, what do I do? How do I help? How do I contribute? How am I, you know, to act as a proper ally? And I used to say, you know, start with not to say that anybody that's coming to me is, is you know, perfectly absolved of any past ills or anything, but at least, you know, the willingness to help shows a lot. So I used to tell them, start with, you know, conversations um, with those people in your circles who may not have your awareness or your desire or the people that definitely show that they don't understand or they're not sympathetic to causes. And you brought up an important thing. As Black people, just because we've been oppressed doesn't mean that we cannot oppress ourselves or oppress or have that type of, you know, attitude that's detrimental to others. So just as I can tell people, you know, find that that racist uncle who says really inappropriate stuff and have a hard conversation with him. I had to have those conversations as I became more aware and held myself more accountable. I had to go to friends who are black and have those discussions with them. So that when, you know, jokes, like you said, if there was something misogynist or racist against another group, I had to say, hey, at, when we're holding people accountable, we have to we have to walk that back and look at what we're doing as well. So I know what you said. We have to move obviously past conversation, but I think you know it, it's going to be very very difficult to be credible um, if you're not doing learning yourself, right? So that was a a big part for me is you know checking myself, checking friends and family members who might have held certain ideologies that you know we feel like it's okay for us to have because were oppressed. So that was a big thing to me. So I, I'm really glad that you and Trevor kind of spoke about those things because I know, you know, there there's feelings in the black community that say other communities look down upon us harshly. And I guess, you know, if we open up and have conversation with those communities too, they might feel that we've 
acted in you know a similar fashion right so um yeah it's it's a lot of work a, a lot of work it's not for the that's another thing i always tell people who are looking for information or trying to help it's it's definitely not work for the faint of heart because it's it's a long lifetime commitment you know and you know we were laughing about it because as a nomad we really understand the element of a journey and we're talking about yeah. the mean of us who just woke up from our own racialized experience. It's like, ah, what the vision, what the vision, what the vision. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, now we right. learn to slow down because, you know, it's, it's, nothing has changed. You know, a system mm -hmm. that has been built over four to 500 years is not going to take overnight. It's not no. going to take this lifetime to make particular changes. But the question is like, what are the small things that we can take on a daily basis to grow right. and learn how to build as a community? So I right. really appreciate the work that Trevor and Stephanie have been doing specifically with Quell, yeah. but also reflect the contribution of many of us within Quell as well. So yourself, yeah. Toya, Christina, Tofek, yeah. Joshua, and this goes on and on and on. But going yeah. back with the conversation about food and identity, I feel that sometimes identity is a bit more complex. Yeah. You know, when people see, and I was saying to Trevor, the first thing that I see, it's, you know, my skin color. And I right. think that there's nothing wrong with the element of a descriptor for somebody's race. Hey, sure. The black I'm proud of my like race. Like, I, I don't care if someone sees it. No, but, but the, the thing about it, it's for me, I was saying to Trevor, is about the descriptor. So if you mm -hmm. describe me as the black guy, there are a lot of other beautiful attributes. The tall, handsome, with a beautiful skull. <laughs> Hair, right. Yeah. Things, the, natural the natural glow. The natural glow. So those yep. are all the attributes should be go along with my own blackness right. as well. And I think of course. sometimes people they they make it the easy way to be able to use just the race as an right. element of a discipline. But for yeah. me, as I was talking about the complexity of the identities, because I was born in Mogadishu, Somalia. I mm -hmm. lived in Italy, and many of my own childhood experience in Italy they're really a mix between pain and joy. Pain because right. being the only black person, I experienced a lot of the ism. Mm -hmm. I, I tell to my kids, guys, don't complain. I got called the nigga so many times that I thought that was my first name. Right. You know, I was like, yeah. Yes. And, and I tell them, and they're like, oh my gosh, did you use the N word? says, yes, because in Italy, where mm -hmm. I grew up in so many other European countries, it doesn't matter how long you've been in a particular place, your race, will always be your race. And yeah. here in Canada, when it comes about identity, I was saying that we love to celebrate mm -hmm. diversity and multiculturalism. But I feel that when we speak a lot about diversity and multiculturalism, we also put in underneath the carpet the indigenous experience as well. So for mm -hmm. us, a community that we've been oppressed, let's celebrate diversity, let's talk about multiculturalism, but the element of a solidarity, union, growing and learning specifically around the colonized space where we live, we cannot deny each other, you know? So uh, I lived in Italy and I, I came from a country that has been colonized. I moved yeah. to Italy, which is the country that actually colonized me. I moved right. to the States, which is the imperial system that actually controls most of the world. And I ran to Canada looking for Canadian people and the <laughs> Canadian people that I was looking for are the most oppressed. And I'm right. saying to myself, this is not an easy place to be. So nah. what is my own identity? What do I see myself in this particular mix? What has been your experience in Canada? Or right. were you born in Toronto? Were you born in I, I was, yeah, no, I was, So I was born in Toronto. My parents were born in Barbados. They came here in the mid seventies. Um, and the funny thing is, is the experience was uh, an interesting one because it's not, I feel like the experience is not only filtered by what you're experiencing, but the perception of you. And I think the idea of being a black person from Canada, especially pre, I don't know, uh, this is going to sound weird, but like pre Drake, like that whole area of like Toronto being recognized and people of color being recognized for their talents in Toronto or Canada on a larger scale was always an interesting one because we dealt with, um, having an influx of American influence through television, um, you know, so media, entertainment, learning, all of those things. And then we, a, a lot of the, a lot of, at least when I was coming up, most of the black kids that I knew were Caribbean. They were of Caribbean descent, Jamaica, Trinidad, Barbados, what have you. So we have the Caribbean identity, uh, trying to kind of find our way to our Canadian identity. And then also just being hammered with like American 
messaging and trying to almost live like a pseudo American kind of life. So there was like these three things kind of at play and like a push and pull from all of them. Cause you go through points where like you want to claim one over the other. And so you, and then you also deal with, I think how you're, how the outside world sees a black Canadian person, because I have really, really close um, friends who are African American. And I always had like a very, um, how I don't know how to say it, but like to me, I, I used to always see black people as all the same, like no matter where you were from, if you were directly from the continent, if you were from an island, if you were from here and then growing to meet others. So whether people um, from Af like direct African descent or America, like I found out that they didn't see me like as one of them. There was a, a big distinction. And I used to have a, a very kind of deep seated resentment towards that because I was like we're brothers you're you're not furthering the cause if you divide but what I think I was missing was that they weren't trying to divide but when your identity has been suppressed so much you need to hold on to it right and it's not always this big monolithic thing I think because of um you know when you grew up in Canada as a minority you have a very small group of people that look like you you know what I mean so a lot of times you're wanting to pull everybody in, whether it's for safety, just, um, you know, feeling comfortable, all of those things. You either kind of really pulled in tight or you might just kind of disassociate from your identity. And so it took me a while to kind of get past uh, my friends who are African, like directly from Africa and my friends who are from the United States saying, hey, like there's differences between us, you know. So a lot went into play in terms of how my identity is kind of shaped and evolved through the years. I don't know if that answered your question completely, but there's a uh, lot at play. Absolutely, absolutely. No, no, I, I totally get it. But, you know, for me, there is also a lot of, a lot of um, experience through colonization and enslavement as well. You see, the experience of the people in the continent is primarily based on colonization. So we have uh, our own cultural, ethnical countries. So we mm -hmm. can say, I'm from Somalia, I'm from Ethiopia, I'm from Nigeria, I'm from Ghana, Togo, Benin, and so forth. So there is a, con a continent with over 54 countries, right? right. So we have a, a sense of identity based on our own nationalism. The, mm -hmm. the Canadian and the African-American experience is a bit different because for many of the experiences of the people that I have met in my life, there is a lack of that kind of a root of where I'm from. So therefore, yeah. your identity is based on your color. We are all mm -hmm. black. But within yeah. us, we also have the element of a prejudice toward the people from the continent who they view the Americans in a certain way, and the people from the Americas who they look at the people from the continent in a different oh. way. And both of them, they're very much, sometimes they're very much based on the colonial and enslaved master yeah. mentality. We yeah. look down upon each other, or otherwise we might just want to assimilate to the best of certain parts of our culture and not necessarily the whole thing. So here, here in Canada, I really love the fact that we are, you know, you're from Barbados and I'm from Somalia, but when we're walking around the streets, nowadays, less than ever, we don't really say where you're from. You know right. what I mean? But right. I think now it's trying to become like, oh, I'm, I'm from the Esplanade, you know, I'm down yeah. the block right here. It's like, yeah, yeah, but you got this kind of peculiar accent, where you're from. So right. they're kind of where you're from, the younger generation, they're not really asking themselves so much. Mm -hmm. I feel like myself, you know, all the generation, we still use in these particular terms. And for me, when it comes about identity, identity is not only other Bayesian or Canadian. You know, mm -hmm. you are as a whole. You don't have to necessarily pick and choose which part you are. You know, right. there are a lot of complexity and a lot of layers uh, within who you are. So although that I'm Somali, but I married a woman from Barbados and my daughter is Bayesian, my daughter is not like half Bayesian and half Somali. She's a right. one person as well. So when she walks around the streets, she say, I'm Lula. I'm not like half of this and half of yeah. that. And I think right. the beautiful part of that when it comes about speaking about our own identity is to look each other as the whole and remind each other that mm -hmm. we are more than just place of birth or just a particular color that we are. Totally agree. And also, I think what that what that takes away from, too, is, um, you know, there are places like Somalia or Barbados um, where not everybody in Barbados looks like me. Not everybody in Somalia looks like you. Right. So if you what happens to those who don't fit the dominant form, but they are from somewhere. Right. So I think that disservice is done as well. 
but it does not look like there's a disservice being done to this dish. Is that the, am I looking yeah, at gonna, sweet potatoes? Put your, finger, put your finger inside, taste the sauce. Oh. <laughs> Man. That's a 10, that's a 10, that's a 10. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just waiting for the phone to drop where literally that is going to work. I, I feel like it's it's around the corner. Okay, for the people that... Please go ahead. No, I was going to say, uh, for those who can't, that don't have the new technology that I clearly have, let them know what I just <laughs> dipped my finger into. So that's our candied yam. So I took some orange juice. I put a little bit of a cinnamon, some star anise, a little bit of a cloves. I boiled it. I part boiled okay. the sweet potatoes put inside there. So I just cook them like for four to six minutes until they just feel a little bit almost cooked. And then yeah. I finish cooking in the orange and turn it into a glaze. So I'm going to wow. keep on cooking them in a little heat. So then it becomes like really sweet and gingery. Now, the Creole duck has a little bit of a heat. So mm -hmm. this thing right here is going to kind of really cool it down. Okay. Okay. Now, okay. While the candy yams go, cornbread is inside the oven. I'm cooking the Swiss chard. Now, I personally love Swiss chard, and the best part of the Swiss chard, I'm just gonna cook them with olive oil and garlic. Going back right. to the conversation of identity. I grew up mm -hmm. in Italy. I honestly bathed in olive oil. So I know anybody who's grown up in Italy or has Italian roots, olive oil is like religion. And I know <laughs> people will be, ostracized, criticized for not caring about olive oil, having a lesser quality olive oil. So do you have, do you have a certain type that you just, you absolutely love or that you recommend? Do you have a secret stash that only comes out when you're cooking special things? I, I do have a secret stash, but the reality is that I don't get paid from none of those companies for me to brand their product. <laughs> so I'm just gonna keep it for myself, but then later on the pipe, like can see this olive oil is really, really I good. I hear you, I hear you, I hear you. So now, yeah. so for the Swiss chard, I separated the stems from the leaves. Because what happens, the stems they tend to be a little bit more fibrous and it takes a little bit longer to cook. So Are you, you using know, both? I'm like using I, I know both. you separated, Absolutely. but you'll use both parts. I separated them just to kind of like a part cook initially, just the stems, because the stems, they take a little bit longer to cook than the leaves. I already okay. washed them. Uh, I'm blanching them. So, as you know, in school, I teach a lot of it, technical cooking, technical aspects of cooking. So, as much right. as I love the recipes per se, at the end of yeah. the day, the recipe always vary. But what you got left is the actual cooking technique. So, for okay. the cooking technique, for this, I have a little bit of a garlic. Again, I'm going to bake it in my good quality olive oil, the good right. one. You know, <laughs> like, how, how do you measure? It's like, well, 10 to 12 dollars is a good olive oil. Okay? Right. 10 to 12 right. is good olive oil. 18 to 20 dollar it means that you're really putting value into it and then when the in-laws are coming oh shit bring it out <laughs> yeah. bring the one is like the the dab the dab <laughs> yeah so <laughs> it's funny how the better the olive oil magically the recipe calls for less of it all of a sudden you don't need as much <laughs> So I, I, I have a little bit of a garlic, a little bit of olive oil, just kind of like a toast, get a little bit of a golden brown. My stems, they're really, really, and I'm going to take the stems out of the water. Okay. And I'm going to add them in my garlic. Then I'm going to do the same thing with the leaves. I'm going to blanch them a little bit in the water, and then mm -hmm. I'm going to finish them in my garlic. So they cook okay. nice and easy. I'm going to toss them, add a little bit of a salt, and then just kind of like let them rest right there. And then we're going to start to work on the duck. Now, cool. During your childhood, are there particular meals or dishes that are always being close to your heart? Right. So, the, again, you know, I mentioned that I have very, I had like a, a very kind of all encapsulating view of all black people growing up. But, you know, being from Barbados and it's a smaller island because you, it wouldn't be fair to produce so much greatness. You know what I mean? So there's less of us, right? So growing up, there was less kids that I knew from Barbados if they weren't already friends or family members. And... You know, when you when you talk to each other and share stories or you go to someone's house for dinner and one thing that you don't that I've never seen at a household that is in a Bayesian household is cuckoo. Right. So I, I'm, I know you're well versed. I know you're very familiar and I know that you're a fan of this, you know, incredible. It's like a cornmeal based dish that is enjoyed with like usually salmon and gravy Um and that one is funny because, like, it, it's so funny what resonates you, with you as 
a child. So the reason why I actually initially had like this fondness for cuckoo was not because I was like in love with the meal per se. Because when I was young, I, I didn't have like a great, I didn't, I didn't have the best palate as a kid, but the name, right? Like I remember just thinking it was like a funny, weird name. So that was like a really, really <laughs> big thing for me. You know, it was like, oh, mom, make cuckoo, make cuckoo. Just because I wanted to say it, I thought it sounded funny. I was just, obviously I was not the, the brightest kid, but um, that that's definitely a big one. So when I went back to Barbados in, I was in Barbados in a work capacity in 2018, 2019 for the uh the food and rum festival so you know we we hit a lot of restaurants and the trip was focused on like the the booming kind of burgeoning scene and the new chefs that are kind of coming up in barbados but we also did um a historic tour where we had very traditional stuff and i remember all day i just couldn't wait till we got to a shop to have to have cuckoo so that was the that's that's a big one for me what about for you growing up well, you know, again, I have a couple of different memories. Childhood memories of a vicious Somalia, four year old, uh, maybe brought it on Friday, you go to the mosque, when you come back to the, from the mosque, you have like a feast, right? So mm -hmm. it was Friday, like the Sunday for a lot of Christian people. So for us, uh, Friday is like there is no school, uh, you know, you go to maybe like to a religion school, and then when you go home after prayer, there is this beautiful thing. I have it, some of the most beautiful, vivid memories of waking up in the morning and having the smell of a chai masala. Like the mm. tea, the cardamom, the cinnamon and ginger and cloves and all these spices. I wake up in the morning and I still have that kind of a sense of a smell, which to me right. like a, a lot of a wonderful, wonderful memories. Yeah. And that one is usually consumed in the morning with a thing called malawa or anjera. Yeah. Malawa okay. would be kind of like a made out of like a sorghum flour. Nowadays, okay. it's made of with regular purpose flour. And so mm -hmm. was the anjera, which is very similar to the Ethiopian anjera. The only difference, we don't use them. We use okay. other sorghum, we use a flour, and we allow it to ferment. The original mm -hmm. sourdough. So again, going back with the conversation on who made first the sourdough, it goes back to the conversation. And during COVID, I got a 15 pounds extra of COVID, primarily baking of bread all day long with my sourdough I, bread. I have the same thing, same thing. There's, and I'm sure there was some sourdough inside of mine amongst many <laughs> other things. But the, I wanted to go back with the conversation, going yeah. back with the conversation about food, identity, and racism, the fact that mm -hmm. most cultures around the world, just like the Confit de Cana, most cultures around the world that have some kind of a bread, most cultures, they have a fermentation. So yeah. from Indians dosa to Mexicans, they make their own tortillas. It's primarily mm -hmm. ferment. You know, to yeah. a lot of the West African countries where they're making the cornmeal, the fermentation aspect, again, it's not a Eurocentric space. No. Most cultures around the world, including Europe, have been right. making a sourdough. So I just wanted to bring that into the conversation as well, because sometimes I feel that our community, you know, we're looking up to the colonizer, to the master, and giving us the sense of a false affirmation that, oh yes, you know, we're making sourdough bread. Meantime, mm -hmm. my grandma's looking like, what are you talking about? We've been making sourdough bread for the longest time. Ethiopians right. are actually some of the most important communities that are making this beautiful, gigantic sourdough crack called the Angera that has been right. celebrated for thousands of years. So I just want to go back with the conversation now. My sweet potatoes, they are almost there. My mm -hmm. greens, the stems already being blanched, the leaves are ready to go. We're going to give a little love to this duck right here. I'm going to be speaking to you, but I'm just going to wash my hands. So please tell me something else. Of course, of course. So actually, something I had to ask is with the sweet potatoes, you refer to them as sweet potatoes. You also refer to them as candied yams. I'd actually, I'd, I've grown up eating sweet potatoes as long as I can remember, and I had only ever heard them referred to as candied yams when um, coming off the lips of uh, someone who was American or during like American Thanksgiving, when you hear about, you know, these big spreads and having it be called candied yams. Was that, is there any distinction that you make between uh, not just what they're called, but how they're prepared? Is, are your, is your version like a candied yam? Yeah, my version is very much to the candied yam, but I want to give you a whole thing about yams. So sweet potatoes and yams, uh, they're interchangeable. It depends on in which culture that you are, number one. 
there are over a hundred varieties of sweet potato, including the Negro sweet potato, which you're gonna laugh about it, but a lot of the Caribbean culture, they have the Negro sweet potato. It looks that it's kind of like the outside skin, kind of looks like the coconut skin. And inside, mm -hmm. it's yam. That's called the Negro yam. The one that mm -hmm. I'm using tonight, the orange yam. But if you look at this one right here, not this one, maybe this one right here, the inside flash, it's white. Right? Oh, right, so, yeah. I'm... From yellow to purple to orange and so forth. So I'm calling them candied because I lived in Virginia for yeah. about two and a half years of my life. Right. And I had African American friends, which they welcomed in their home, and I celebrated Thanksgiving for the first time. And mm -hmm. I've never really knew what Thanksgiving was because growing up in Italy, we don't have a Thanksgiving. Right. And to me, it was some of the most beautiful memories because I felt loved yeah. from the culture and the community that I didn't really know. And I felt kind of also weird because I was still saying and speaking this way, Hey, good morning. How are you? <laughs> what is wrong with you? They're like, what? what? Is wrong with you? Yeah. You know, I had a German girl, you know, I dressed Man, me a Please. I, I, wore, I wore tons of a cologne. It's like, what? guy, you look like us. But what's up with it? Hello, good morning. How are you? <laughs> Tomorrow <laughs> is is Thursday. I finally I finally have my day straight for Throwback Thursday. I we need a picture of Chef Bashir with the Jerry Curl. I, I need to see that. I need to I did I did a little. I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of the same. Not I wasn't I wasn't as old as you when I decided to get rid of it. I hope. But I, I, I had to do it. I think we all had that little bit of um, soul glow influence, you know? Listen, I, I, I'm, I'm going to apologize. Uh, my CEO just reminded me that I cast and cursed. I didn't really mean to. So I'm going to apologize because I wasn't supposed to be cussing and cursing on Instagram. So I'm going to, I'm really sorry that I cast and cursed. I got a little bit caught up with excitement. Talking Part about of your apology. identity. Part of my identity as well. Part of your identity. Um, what can we do? Absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, so I had a wonderful meal. So those candied yams, the greens, and the cornbread was the first time that I actually had a, an African-American experience. Because when mm -hmm. I lived in Italy, there was nothing really celebrated like that. There are a lot of other beautiful holidays uh, and a lot of festivities in Italy. But being on the table with a bunch of black folks was the first time for me. Because right. the only experience that I had, and mostly were mostly the childhood experience in Italy. I had a family right. members, but there were never really this congregation of black people, you know, the neighbors coming by and everybody loving and hugging and everybody yeah. spraying. And I'm like, wow, this, this feels great. So yeah. when I'm doing this, there are a lot of layers of intersectionality that are really special to me. So candy games are there. My greens are there, ready to be sauteed. I'm gonna shut off this plug right here. Let's check in what our cornbread looks like, and then we're gonna cook the duck. Okay. Oh, Brian. I smell it. No. It smells incredible. Oh. It it's... smells incredible. Uh, let me break off a little piece. <laughs> it popped out of my. That's good. Not as good as mom's, but very, very good. Very, very good. I'm not sure if you see this, but this is a little bit of a butter because you know cornbread goes with butter, and uh, I hate to do this um, to you, but. Like, one, the cornbread wow. is still hot. It has to be bathed in butter. Now, of course, because it just absorbs more of it. It holds it, right? It's not going to pour off the top. It's going to get down inside, right in the middle of it. Exactly. Exactly. So we're just going to let this cornbread just sit down in this way and just like okay. allow them, like take a moment to like soak it all in. Now, right. I'm going to move the cornbread right here so the cornbread okay. can really. Okay, so cornbread is right here. Okay. Now, I told you that I had these beautiful Creole seasonings. Yes. The candied yams are right here. Okay. So, my Creole seasonings are here on the duck. Okay. I have a cold for a man. You know, usually when you see cooking chicken, duck, pork, or any meats, you want to pan fry them, especially because duck has a lot of a fat. But are you doing a, a, a... Sorry, Chef, are you doing a breast? Are you doing a breast? I'm using the breast. I'm using the breast. Okay. Yeah, and the reason that I'm using the breast because the breast it takes only six to eight minutes to cook. Okay. Okay. Heavily seasoned with my seasonings, and I'm gonna put in a cold frying pan. You know, oh, usually okay. you see like, people they do blackening. You know, they they pan fry it. 
Now, right. I found that many times that, that frying it on a high heat, it really burns the spices. So I'm going to okay. start in a cold pan. And what happened is that because of all the fat, I want the fat to slowly render without burning the spices. Right. I'm going to cook down just like on a medium-low heat. My dad so is going to take a look. Right. Is a cold pan recommended for other other uh, meats or items that m have a higher fat content, or is it duck specifically that you found that when it was a little too hot at the onset, they would burn the spices, or is that like a general recommendation? I'm doing this one specifically for things that I don't want the spices to burn, right? Mm. So I don't want the spices to, to burn, so while there is a lot of effect, the fat renders, but it slowly cooks already. It's also going to cook it at the same time, mm. fat and spices together. If I start oh. in a high heat, when I see them, the spices are going to melt down. So this one right here, medium low heat, and it's going to cook up like that for at least a minute. So there is like an even, even nice color as well. So those are the okay. things that I love. Now, in most culture, going back with food and identity, in most cultures around the global south, people don't eat that medium rare, don't eat... Right. Uh, any meat's medium rare. You know, I don't know about your home, but in my home, if you see anything on the medium rare, they're like, I'm out. So the funny thing is, is like, I'm, I'm doing this tonight from my parents' home, and um, I, was, I was working on a bunch of projects for some client stuff I'm doing. So it involved cooking. And I was, uh, I was grilling some meat and stuff, and I was finished because I do now, you know, um, <laughs> medium rare but like i remember my sister was with me at the grill and she's like you better leave mom and dad's on <laughs> a little bit longer because i've moved into my like my newer mindset and that's actually such an it's I, I don't know how much time we have left or how deep or how like off the conversation might veer but that's such an interesting point that you bring up um you know how you're looked upon as a black person if you eat certain things a certain way you know what i mean it's like funny. it's funny that you say that because in other african countries i'm, I'm mm -hmm. making ethiopia as an example ethiopia as an example they have the original beef tartar right okay kifta. it's called yes, kifta. Yes. yes you buy fresh good quality beef you have a combination of a spice and seasonings uh, you know, called berbere, and then you just wrap them around and you have a little bit of a ghee. Right. And you dip and dump, and you eat in a little bit of a meat. Now, the, yeah. usually the meat is served at room temperature, so you're not biting into cold flesh. Right. right. Yeah. So, again, some cultures within the multi ethnic African community can eat that raw mm -hmm. beef, but when it comes to about chicken, I don't know about what's going on in your home. Chicken get washed like you wash the cloth. Yeah, yeah I'm bleed. sorry. Like it, it has to. And I've read countless things about. Oh no, you don't wash your kitchen. Your chicken. Sorry, no, it has to. I'm saying it now. Wash your chicken, please. Like, and it, it's it's hard, tedious work. Depending on you know what your chicken looks like when you bring it home, but it's work that has to be done. It has to. So be I'll done. tell you. I'll a, a funny story that I think I've said a thousand times because I found it so humorous. Many, many years ago, when I started to uh, finesse my wife, right? It's like trying to charm her with my cooking skills. Like, yeah. Can you let me show you? <laughs> you know, my wife, she's the, she's the second youngest out of a family of eight. So, okay. in a family, family of eight, you don't eat a lot of meat. You know, when you are the youngest, there are a lot of yeah. guys, you just end up to eating the chicken wings and so forth. So I bought this beautiful, organic, farm-raised chicken and so forth. And um, here, yeah, I'm putting a little bit of a garlic, some oil, some lemon, and some thyme. And my wife tells me, yeah, and washing it with salt and lime? And I'm like, what are yeah. you talking about? <laughs> this, all these beautiful seasonings and this and that. So like, really, you're not going to wash it with salt and lime. And I'm like, why do we need to wash it? like, listen, if you want this relationship to go any further, Okay, and you want yeah. any other kind of people to come to this house, you better wash that chicken with salt and yeah. lime. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you ain't gonna go anywhere. And then, know. you know, I've learned that it's not only like a Bayesian thing, like many communities around the world, they actually wash the, the, the poultry, the chicken, yeah. with salt, lime, and or vinegar as well. And yeah. there are a couple of different reasonings. A, to kill bacteria, because people mm -hmm. used to consume the meat in a certain way, and then what happens is like they die. And then the other one, because it provides flavor. 
So washing it with salt and lime provides flavor. And then the yeah. other technical aspect, it's a washing it with lime and or lemon or vinegar. What happens is it breaks down the enzymes of the protein. Therefore, it becomes like a tenderizer. So when you're thinking about making a brine, the original brine that many of those communities were doing it, there was a three, three reasoning behind. Killing bacteria, right. breaking down the enzyme, and tons yeah. and tons of flavor. So I just wanted right. to share that with you now. My duck breast, you know, I got a really nice color right here. So oh, wow. Sure. Right. Okay. Really nice sear on there. And not only, but, but you see the spices, they got a nice color, but they didn't yeah. really burn. I'm gonna right. put it upside down inside the oven, six, seven minutes. Okay. okay. Now, the temperature, I dropped it down to 350 degrees. My Swiss chard is there, a little bit of oil. Okay. My candy yams are almost there. Just gonna warm them up again. And while my duck is cooking, I'm gonna start plating. No, no question. Now, okay. Ryan. We are on the, today's the 22nd, 23rd, what, what day are we You're, you're, asking, you're right. asking me, but it's the 24th. It's the 24th. <laughs> it's the 24th. We got four yeah. more days going on for Black History Month, right? Four. And, uh, and we have some huh? Four, Sorry? five, I don't know, whatever. Yeah, right. <laughs> and we have four or five days left. Uh, so now this conversation is going to go to March. So March is coming again. What are you talking in March? Because now Black History Month is done, and we talked about above 28 days for Black folks, Indigenous community. Are there other things that are important to you and Quell that perhaps the followers should know? Well, I, the, the first to actually talk for more than in March is going to be Marie and Ren Navarro. So another incredible black member of the team that is going to be dropping, you know, just valuable knowledge on uh, beer and diversity. Beer diversity is her, her handle and an incredible account. So doing this same work, as well as just um, keeping my messaging the same, you know, I mean, I create content and that's my mainstay, but I also do a, a lot. I shouldn't say, I hate saying I do a lot, like making myself seem more important than I am. But I mean, it's very important for me to highlight other black creators um, in the space, especially in Toronto, there's not a lot of people that look like me that do what I do. Um, Shouts to Edin of Black Foodie and Nadia Travel and Munchies. Like there's there's great, incredible creators out there, but there's not a ton of us in terms of having you know whether it's large followings or accessibility to um, the opportunities and events that allow us to kind of grow. And so whether it's people from here or in the U.S. or anywhere, I, I try to highlight a lot of whether it's, you know, black chefs, black creators. And I mean, yeah, in, in Black History Month, I, I make a point of doing extra that had been like years before. But I, now it's just like I'm, I'm keeping that up. It's not that the space isn't going to highlight um, creators or foods or, you know, people of all backgrounds, but there's definitely a very important thing because I, I, when I came into the space and I started to grow the account, it, it felt like people on the restaurant side of the business and the, the marketing side of that business didn't either know or, or care that black people ate. Like there was no messaging that felt like it was inclusive um, at a high level. It didn't feel like people were trying to get us in their doors or, you know, understood that we care about things outside of, you know, these generalized frames of like, say, you know, West Indian food or African food. And that not only um, do what we make and create and have to offer is incredible, but like we have interest in all kinds of things. And I felt like there's a very kind of closed, um, closed, uh, like do people kind of look the other way and I, I don't know if it's like they don't want us in the spaces or they don't feel like there's power or value in the dollar or that we just were non-existent so to me it wasn't just about me creating opportunity for myself or going places but it was like letting them know that there's like you know just so many important voices that they have to hear lenses that they have to see this food captured through um, and stories that they that they're they're not hearing 
that um, I, if I have the ability to use my platform to highlight others, I'm going to do that. And I, I just feel like I just turned that volume like way up and I want to keep running with it through the months and yeah. years to come. I, I really like the fact that you put it the financial dollar and cents as well. Because sometimes, mm -hmm. as you were saying, people they tend to, especially in Canada, they don't understand the value of the black dollar as well. In the United mm -hmm. States, I actually don't understand it because in the United yeah. States, although there's over 300 million of people in there, 340 million people, 43 million people are black folks as well. And black folks are predominantly spending a lot of money. They contribute a lot to the American economy as well mm -hmm. when it comes about consumer because we are some of the largest consumer driven product businesses yeah. for yeah. me it's important to reflect that you know having a platform that we speak about those issues specifically when it comes about food and identity or just like our own identity as well it also correlates with our dollar and cents as well you know a lot mm -hmm. of the times people they are made to feel almost that we are that we don't really contribute you know we are, yeah. we, are we are more like you know, people that they, they, they tend to forget that we are uh, we are not just like a, a recipient of the value of this particular country. We are yeah. contributors to this particular country as well. And I really yeah. want to put a moment to think about it because, as you were saying, you know, when you cannot find the space for people to welcome you, then you created your own platform as well because there yeah. are people who are willing to feel, they are willing to hear and see and understand the value of your contribution as well, whether if it is financial mm -hmm. or primarily to any other particular platform as well. So mm -hmm. are there any particular questions that are out there before we start to play and we get getting all Actually, the Actually, you know what? Someone had a question for you, a really good one, and I had meant to ask you, but I just got caught up. They asked, they said, Chef, have you ever had problems with not being accepted in your early years due to your Italian slash Somali background having a foot in two countries? You know, not only that I had a, a difficult time, and I was mentioning how many times that I've been called the, the N-word, but you know, as I was saying to my kids as well, Ryan, there is a word that is even more hurtful than the N-word. Mm. When someone calls you the N-word, it is a clear affirmation on how somebody feels about you. Mm -hmm. When someone says to you, you're not like them, it is more painful, because now you are not one of them, but you definitely not one of us, right? right. So you kind of lose the perplexed in trying to understand your own identity. Like then, if I'm not one of them and I'm not one of you, then who yeah. I am or where I am, right? So my own childhood, there is a lot of this tribulation, there is a lot of a complexity in trying to think and understand who I am and what I am. So I live with that kind of a um, emotional burden because of being imposed through colonization. But my experience is not a, the only experience. There are so many other communities, there are so many other racialized people throughout Europe and many other parts of the world that they've been made to feel in a particular way. You know, are you too black or are you too white? Oh, yeah. Brian, you know, you're really well spoken. You're so articulate. Yeah, I hear that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like you're you getting know, patted you know, on the head like a good dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh man, yeah. <laughs> And the, the crazy part is that the assumption is that like they're paying, paying, paying you the highest compliment when telling you that, you know? Because it's so, not that you're just void of their negative stereotypes. You, they feel like you're void of, because you're not like them, that you completely have no, um, you know, relation to, to your culture or to your people. And that, 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 that's the only way that someone would feel comfortable telling you something like that. Uh, I actually have a question for you. Um, you know, Somali born, going to Italy, uh, which is, you know, predominantly white, and then going to America, um, where there's diversity, but it's still segmented. Did it was, was there a feeling of being out of your element more in either place or was it different? You know, when you are a child and you are surrounded and you assimilated within a particular culture, you're not really paying attention because things around you, they've been normalized, especially when you don't have a compass for somebody saying to you, oh, actually, this is really a racist comment. You shouldn't be saying those particular things. And because I've been colonized mentally to think that a lot of experience that I was having, they were normal. And when I see a lot of my own community, I will look 
down on them because, quote unquote, the colonizer had made me feel and think that I'm superior to them. Yeah. So I'm walking around looking like, look at these people right here, begging right. around the street. Meantime, I never really understood the social economic reasonings behind them because yeah. the same colonizer has deployed, deployed every single thing from our own country, from our own continent, and left us in that particular space. So that particular right. colonial frame of mind that, that I had, and many other people within the racialized community had it, it's been really, really entrenched. So many times, and you know, we had the analogy that when we're speaking, we're still using the same colonial lenses. And when yeah. we're looking at ourselves, we're still thinking in a particular way that there is almost no value to our food. You know, we mm -hmm. had an example about Adrian as an example. You know, and we, Adrian is a fantastic chef, a lovely yeah. friend of ours. And yeah. I was asking him, we're we making a meal together. And I said to him, what are you making? You're making oyster. You know, I was thinking about Jamaica. You know, there are a lot of assumptions that Jamaican people don't eat oysters. And he's, he's a fantastic cook. And I said, yeah. what are you going to put in there? Oh, I'm gonna put it, this uh, confetti mignonette. I was like, let me ask you something. You're making a Jamaican dish, yeah? So yes. Mm. And w w what is this called? It's called the mignonette. But if you be in Jamaica, what would you call it? And he say, I'll call it a dressing. Right, so yeah. So why don't you call it a dressing? Yeah, you know? And yeah. we begin to think and feel that perhaps if we're using French terminologies, that suddenly right. our dish is being, uh, you know, there is a more worth and more value around it. Now, I do understand yeah. that there are cooking terminology that we use for sure. other cooks to understand, but the general audience don't understand it. But the, when the general audience, they see that, it's like, oh, wow, that's, you know, that's something totally different. So my experience in, 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 as a child in, in, uh, in Italy, uh, it, it, I didn't really understand the complexity out of it until I became an adult. And now that I'm here in Canada, I'm growing and I'm starting to think about how painful my experience was. So I think I'm finding comfort in food and the fact that I'm able to use a lot of analogies, using food yeah. as a metaphor, to be able to speak about those experiences that kind of really, really hurt. Give me a second. So, of course. Ooh, how are we doing? Ah, uh, it's quacking. The duck is quacking. The duck was talking to me and was like, listen to me, but she stopped talking to Ryan, pay attention to me. <laughs> Eat me. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not really sure if you can see it, but I have like a little tray right here. So okay. I'm, I'm I see sure it. you heard in a lot of restaurants, uh, the duck, what it's called, is like resting, right? Yeah. And what happened yeah. the, now, like, all the juices are kind of like bubble up. They're kind of excited right there. It's like, oh, Ryan is going to have a lovely dinner tonight. <laughs> no, Ryan is not going to have it. But, you know, maybe Trevor might pass by and get this duck. But there are going to be plenty of ducks for you, Ryan. So now the meat is so. resting right here. All the juices right. are going to be going there. So let's allow this duck to rest for like two to three minutes because we are okay. just about three minutes from finishing the show. So I'm going to let right. this duck rest in here. Are there particular experiences that you had it as a child in Canada that made, me, that made you think whether you belong, you don't belong? Are there particular oh, experiences that really resonate Yeah, and I mean, early around food, you know, like bringing lunch to school and uh, especially on a Monday where, you know, traditionally, like in Barbados, like um, after church, like people just cook. Like it, it's, it's church and a big family meal. So even being here in Canada, Sunday dinners are something to look forward to at my parents' house. And that would mean that for sure on Monday, my lunch would consist of, you know, uh, peas and rice, because in Barbados it's peas and rice, um, you know, some ch baked chicken, macaroni pie, things like of that nature. And other kids might have been bringing sandwiches or Lunchables, something like that. And it would be like, oh, what's what's this? Why are you eating this? You know what I mean? It was weird to me because like, I mean, you, you assume chicken and rice is universal <laughs> and then mac pie that I'll take over any style of mac and cheese in the world. You know, all those other kids probably lived off craft dinner probably five, six days a week, but they were like, well, that's not macaroni. And I'm like, yes, it is. You know what I mean? So those kind of things. And when it's me and in my elementary school, because I, I went to a French immersion school. So two other black kids in my in my grade at the time, um, you don't have anybody kind of linking up with you to help fight that battle. Right. And a lot of times numbers just decide who's victorious. So if 27 kids have peanut butter and jelly and three of us have rice and peas, like 
who's made to think that they have the wrong lunch. So it, it started and it was around things as simple as food. And that's why I think, um, you know, my, my kind of goal to change how we're seen in the food space is so important. I, I don't, I'm not saying I made the correlation back in grade school and charted this path, but I, I definitely see the connections and why it's important and why it's important that like our identity around ourselves and our food is, is highly celebrated. Um, you, know, you know, you had brought up the, the mignonette story and I, you, you and I, we had discussed this on the phone before. And I think I was telling you that um, when I post like food from Jamaican restaurants, um, you know, and I believe in calling things and people by their name, their, their proper name, how they want to be identified and addressed. So, you know, if I have fried chicken from a Jamaican restaurant, if I'm posting it on a story, I'm saying fry chicken. Right. And, you know, there's already an assumption that West Indian food should cost less and it's not as sophisticated or not as elevated as other types of cuisine. And then it's funny because at first I would struggle, like, should I write fried F-R-I-E-D, you know, chicken or should I write fried chicken the way that it is on the menu at a Jamaican restaurant? Because in Jamaican cuisine, like the 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 cuisine is determined by, you know, the act right? So stew chicken, fried chicken, those kind of things. That's why you get the way it's presented grammatically. And I was like, yeah. you know, I, I was waiting for someone to chime in to talk about my grammar or you're thinking, oh, is someone going to so, like think, oh, that this black guy is less educated because he's not using the correct grammar to describe the chicken. But if we're looking at the identity and it's from a Jamaican restaurant cooked by a Jamaican person, then it's fried chicken, right? So um, very important things to um, to always kind of tackle and be mindful of when we're working in the food space. Okay, listen, I I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear. You. I can hear Ryan. I I, I know I know that you're mostly salivating. Maybe that might be the reason why you're coming closer. But I can yeah. hear you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, it's these earpieces. Oh my god. So, What's going so, on here? <laughs> so uh, candied yams. I'm not sure if you can see the actual gloss into it, but like those are the candied yams, uh, the uh, steam greens. I love mostly the stem. Like the, the leaves I great, but I think because the stem they have a bad rap. So I'm gonna they start do. with my Yeah, the stems is have the same nutritional value. Uh, right. so, the, the, the greens are there, the cornbread is in there. Now, the duck has been resting, and I can see a lot of those beautiful juices going inside my pan. And I told you before, growing up in Italy, every meal, whenever you have a pasta, there's always some bread. I mean, there's a bread for every meal. And when you have a bread and you have a sauce, there is this thing called scarpetta. And scarpetta is kind of like a little shoes, because you take the little piece of a bread, becomes like almost a hill, and you sop up the whole thing. Right. I'm sure you have it, whether you, you're eating with the, uh, with roti or basap shots, you know, that piece of a bread that you oh, yeah. all the, that's exactly what this cornbread deserves, all this beautiful love. Like, they didn't have enough butter. So I'm going to take my duck right now. I'm going to rest it. Okay. All the juices are there. And I'm, I don't know, I don't know if Trevor Louis is going to come or not, but I'm ready to have dinner. Ah, man, I honestly, I wish I could be there to um, help you clean up. <laughs> I have a little Those potato together. <laughs> exactly. Uh, are there any other questions before we just like... You know, yeah, it? let's see, because I, I know we hit time. It was always such a, a great conversation. Um, let's see. Wow. Lots of love, lots of comments. I'm trying to see if there's... Yeah, someone was saying there's an unspoken idea that Caribbean food is not fancy. That's so true. Um, yeah, that there's no man. There's a lot of a lot of good comments in here. A lot of love for your kitchen, for your space too. <laughs> Trevor said he's on his way. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna leave that duck for for Trevor now. I'm not a bragger, but you know what? I've been working on this dish for quite some time. I'm not wow. sure if you can see the color. That looks I'm beautiful. I'm not sure if you can see the color. 
Yeah. Okay. That crust around the edges. Oh my goodness. Okay. There's a little bit of a fat right here that is trying to kind of like crisp up. I can That's see the duck part. oozing off the juices on the cornbread. Right. And now I have this cornbread. So all those, the oil that has been rendered from the, the actual duck and all of those Creole seasonings, I'm going to add them right here on top of the bread. Oh. No? Maybe even on top of the greens. Brilliant. There we go. Wow, that's beautiful. Buttermilk um, cornbread. Buttermilk cornbread. Um, yep. Steamed greens. Duck, Creole duck breast and candied yam. Wow. You're an artist. You're an artist, bro. <laughs> Incredible. I'm not even having it, and I can only imagine what that tastes like. But can I say something to you? I, I, this is good, right? This is good. But let me tell you what actually I'm looking forward to, okay? Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what I'm really looking forward to. This is good. I'm, I'm happy about this. This is good. Yeah. But you know what I'm looking forward to? What's this. that? Oh, yeah. This is uh, one of my favorite meals in our home. Actually, this is like one of our whole family favorite. My wife makes this beautiful split pea soup with cassava dumplings and chicken. Primarily okay. the chicken necks and backs. You play a rock, paper, scissor, who's going to get the necks and who's going to get the yeah, back. Yeah. There are chicken wings and stuff like that too, but like there is a lot of a beautiful food that I have. And the duck, don't get me wrong, it's lovely, the cornbread and so forth. I had a plenty of time. But when I'm looking for something to kind of suit me, to yeah. make me feel loved, to make me feel homed, you know, this is what I'm going for. You know, like, like the duck is great, but you know, sometimes you're just, when you eat, you're just showing off at this point. No, I, I, I was, I was, I'm going back with the conversation around identity. And like, there's a lot of a food that is dope, that is beautiful, but sometimes like the simplest ingredients, like I cannot tell you how much my family love this food. I, I'm, I'm, I might be the chef at home, but actually yeah. even the chef when he gets the night off uh, deserve to be fed and showing a little bit of love. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm giving love. I'm showing love for my family all the time. But this soup right here, it really speaks <laughs> about the type of things that I'm really make me feel wholesome, you know? Right. Just some, there are some cassava dumplings, yeah. pea, chicken and bean cooking inside there. This is like a simple, humble soup yeah. you know, that I'm willing to pay the same amount of money that I will be paying for this duck right here. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. This duck right here with the candied yams, the green and the cornbread, as juicy, beautiful, delicious, sensual as it is, mm -hmm. doesn't, have, doesn't have anything better than this meal right here. So I just wanted to leave that. Yeah. Oh, duck fat is getting a, a lot of love. Um, in the chat, Trevor said, never waste duck fat. We got comparisons to liquid gold for bacon fat. Um, that's And dumplings, too. Just even another another piece of identity, because growing up in a Bayesian household, like, that's what I know a dumpling to be, you know, before being introduced to all other kinds of food. That, that was a dumpling for me, right? So, you know, we have um, a lot of work to do in terms of spreading this this gospel and i'm glad that we have you at the helm of it um educating enlightening making it fun making things interesting being so generous with your time i, I can't say generous with the food because my table's <laughs> empty <laughs> but um it, honestly this has been a pleasure man i feel like we could talk for a couple more hours or a couple more days um i will let you eat your incredible looking soup and the rest of the food. But before we get out of here, any final thoughts, anything that you're working on, anything that's coming up that you want the people to know? For those of you who might not know, check my bio on my link tree. Next week, I'm launching my new series of nomadic comfort cooking classes. Four weeks starting on the 6th, it's gonna go up to the 27th, it's gonna be fun. The duck is going to be definitely on the menu for week three as well. The first week, we're going to do the Swahili food or the coastline of the Somali cuisine. Second week, we're going to do like very North African and Mediterranean. Third week is going to be Creole. And number four week, we're going to go to the Bahia. 
but it was the yep. largest amount of slaves in Brazil. So that's one of my favorite region in Brazil, the Bahia region. So that's the food that I'm going to be cooking. That's my own yearning, my need to find something uh, that is meaningful, something to, to speak to my kids about. Listen, I love this duck. I love the coffee. I love all of those things. This is dope as well. <laughs> you know, like, this is what I want to share with everybody. So uh, I'm so grateful for you and I had this opportunity right here. Thank you so very much for sharing your depth of knowledge as well. Um, and, and, and thanks again for Quell for creating a platform for people like ourselves can speak freely, uh, feeling safe. We can have a, a room full of people. And again, as I was saying to Trevor, the table is great to bring people close. But you know, in a place that we've been colonized, maybe the table is not what we really need. Maybe we just need to sit down on the floor, you know, just allow us to be grounded. There is no real hierarchy, you know, there is no man, king of the table as well, right? Sure. I think the table just takes up too much of a space. So Break I think the legs off the table. Off the table, off the table, <coughs> on the floor, and let's share, <coughs> let's share more of those conversations. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> um bro thank you. you um for me um you know I'm, I'm just kind of doing my normal thing look forward to more new content i do have my own signature sandwich called the eat famous sandwich that's dropping <laughs> on the menu at uh burgum at uh, central burgum their mississauga location i believe it's 50 955 Latmer in Mississauga. So I created a sandwich. It's on the menu. You can only get it there. Um, also, this Saturday, I'm going to be co-hosting um, season the, the first episode of the new season of The Heightened Chef. It's an infused dinner series that I've had um, the pleasure of co-hosting last year with my brother, Vanishing Point. He's actually... Oh, yeah, Vanishing Point CEO. He's actually on here right now. Uh, we're doing that this Saturday. Um, and yeah, man, just more, more food content. And of course, more of these, more than episode three next, not next Wednesday, but the following Wednesday, I believe it's March 11th. The short February has me messed up on my dates, but it's going to be myself and Ren Navarro from uh, Beer Diversity. We're going to be chopping it up just again, as like we did at the beginning to remind everybody that, you know, black history is more than 28 days. Um, all of these things that we, we celebrate justfully, we, we need to do more. Um, and we're just going to be, you know, uh, shedding more insight, more love, giving the opportunity for people that need to be heard uh, some time to speak. And thanks to everybody also who joined in, uh, that lit up the chat, that participated, that asked questions, that showed love. I mean, if it wasn't for y'all, there would be no point in us doing this. So I just hope everybody is safe and joins us again. And we, we got to do this again. And I, I need some of the soup and the duck. Okay? <laughs> Both. I'm Both. Really very close. I'm going to be doing more of this cooking. And, and, and I feel I will feel very honored to be able to share a meal with you, my brother. So thank Same. you very much. Same. You stay safe. You Peace too. Everybody. Thanks, everyone. Peace. Love. Love too, brother. Take care. <laughs>